in order to become analytical about this, so what is this form of didactic pedagogy? So we've just done a kind of an impressionistic, um, very subjective view of what it feels like uh, to be a person in those uh, in those classrooms through a number of writers and a number of people who are writing autobiographies later in their life. What I want to do now is I want to become analytic um, about didactic pedagogy. And I've got here um, eight dimensions that I'm going to examine. And in order to build this idea of a paradigm, I'm going to apply the same eight criteria, the eight um, issues in these eight dimensions when it comes, when we come in later videos to discuss authentic pedagogy, what's its shape and form, and then transformative pedagogy, what's its shape and form. So I'll go through each of these one by one to analyze didactic pedagogy. The first thing is architectonic, and by architectonic we, need, we mean the configuration of the space, you know, the architecture of the space if you like. So here we are, the kids in the classroom, uh, there are four walls in the classroom, but the architectonics is not just the four walls, it's the way the desks are configured. So this photograph is actually taken from the perspective of the teacher, so the teacher's looking down over the classroom, and you can see the classroom is of a certain size, and it's of a size where that kid way over there in the back of the room um, will be able to hear a teacher without, micro without a microphone. So in other words, it's designed for it to be a space where it's possible to hear the teacher um, and any larger than this, it may not be possible, you know, it has to be configured in a kind of an audio kind of way for it to work as a communications architecture. But then when we look at the arrangement of the desks here, what you can see is the eyes of the children are all coming to the teacher, right? So in other words, the desks are arranged so it's not for Really, the students talk to anybody else. They might, at a pinch, be able to talk to the person beside them or the person behind them, but that's all. But it's not even really configured for that. It's configured to be a communications architecture which is about these um, uh, linear lines from the teacher to the students. And, and so the way in which the desks are configured builds shapes. I mean, the physical shape of this room and the arrangement of the desks shapes the forms of communication which are going to occur in that room. This is a rather um, extreme example of exactly the same principle. Um, this is a picture used um, in uh, Foucault's Discipline and Punish book uh, of a lecture hall in the Fresne prison in France, uh, when, maybe in the 19th century. Um, uh, and the lecturer there is lecturing the students on the evils of alcoholism, but you can see there Absolutely, there was no way that the prisoners would uh, talk to each other. They were just simply to, they were simply framed by the space to listen to the lecture theatre. Now, I just wonder how many didactic classrooms are actually like this, except the little walls hard up behind the people. They're designed for, for, uh, for there not to be that communication, it just to be the communication between the one central person and all the people listening. Secondly, I want to talk about the discursive configuration of the didactic classroom. And we have a number of discursive um, artefacts. You can see here all the students have textbooks uh, on their on their desks. And presumably it's the same textbook and they're all on the same page at the same time because they're doing the same work. The teacher may well stand at the front of the room and there's the teacher and give a lecture to the students. The teacher may well have a Q&A session where the students all put up their hands. She asks a question, one person answers the question and the teacher says, yes, that's right or that's wrong. So that's another characteristic discursive form of these classrooms. Or, and the other thing which was quite common was this idea of recitation. Everybody answers at once. Everybody uh, reads something together. Um, so in other words, these, these were several of the kind of discursive practices that classically occurred in these uh, these kinds of classrooms. Now, in course, of course, these um, discursive practices, textbooks, lectures, Q&A, recitation, they all have certain assumptions in them about the role of the learner to knowledge and the role of the learner to the teacher. Which brings me on to the third point, which is intersubjective. So how are the relationships of teacher, students to each other, configured? Well, firstly, there isn't much interaction between student and student, and if it is, it's off task and irrelevant. Um, you can create some sort of student to student interaction in these kinds of spaces, these kinds of pedagogies, but by and large, it, it really doesn't happen. That's not the idea. So if you like, it's a kind of a, a hub and spoke model where the, the teacher is the discursive hub, the, the um, uh, 
and the students are all around them. So intersubjectively, there are these relationships going on, but essentially that relationship with the teacher to student is a relationship of command and compliance. Uh, answer this question, I'll answer the question. Do this work, I'll do this work. So the teacher is strongly in a position of control. So the intersubjective configuration of the uh, students and teachers, which is very little happening laterally, or little or nothing happening laterally between students, um, and this relationship, intersubjective relationship of the teacher and the student, which is essentially a command and control relationship. What does this mean socioculturally, my fourth point? Well, what this builds is a social architecture of sameness or one size fits all learning. So everybody has the same textbook. And when the teacher speaks, they really need to speak to about the middle of the class. So some kids mightn't be picking up on it, but hopefully they're getting roughly what's going on. Some kids, it might be a bit slow for them and boring, they already know it. But somehow or other, because everybody is hearing the same message at the same time from the teacher, everybody's in this communication architecture is listening to one message. There can only be one message at a time. It, the basic underlying um, social architecture is actually one of sameness, which is we're going to try to um, uh, to configure you all as the same. What are, what are the underlying cultural purposes of this sameness? Well, one element of these purposes is the idea of a nation. So the kids come to school, they might speak different dialects. The kids come to school um, and they mightn't even speak the, the dominant language. Their language at home might be an immigrant language or an indigenous language. But when they're in that classroom, in this architecture of sameness, they're gonna become the same. And part of the exercise is firstly to learn the national language so they can become one of the great masses, one of the homogenous citizenry that's out there. And the other thing that was literally done in this place is national stories were taught. So if you came in from a particular ethnic group, forget about that story. If you came in from an indigenous group, forget about that story. That what you did in social studies is you learned about the nation and in the morning you saluted the flag and you sang the national anthem. So it was about building this homogenous citizenry around the idea of uh, nation. And in fact, in a way, schools were, were one of the most active places to promote nationalism um, uh, in the sense of you know, loyalty to the nation, willingness to go to, to war if asked, um, uh, an identification with the nation as a, as a singular kind of entity and so on. So in a, way, in a way, one of the agendas was to ignore or write over those differences that the students brought to school and to build uh, a socio-cultural environment in that classroom, which is essentially one of sameness. And what we did also in these spaces is if you were sufficiently different, we were going to exclude you. So in other words, um, you know, if you uh, didn't speak any of the first language, maybe we'll send you off to an English language class. If you were disabled in some way or another, uh, we can't really deal with that because we have to be able to deal with people who are all the students more or less at the same level of capacity, ability, or uh, um, and so on. So what we did is we we uh, streamed classrooms. So they were streamed by ability. They were streamed by not having disability in the classroom. So what we did is we tried to build these classrooms. So the students were as similar as possible in order to be able to speak to the whole class in the same voice at the same time. And in order to do that, we had to exclude certain people, right? Um, if you're disabled or and so on. Um, or if you were to come in, the condition of your coming in was assimilation, which is okay, perhaps you don't have uh, the first language of the language of instruction, but try and learn it as quickly as you, as you can. If we throw you into the deep end, you become immersed in it, you'll become assimilated and you'll become just like the, all the other students. So in other words, the assumption was if you were different um, and we let you in, we didn't exclude you, if, we were, if you were different, you would become the same by virtue of a process of assimilation. And one of the purposes of that classroom was the assimilation process.